Love it, love it, love it. In Christ alone, one of my one of my all time favorites. Anyone else out there uh, with me on that one? That one and Inagata De Vida. Love those two songs. All right, Luke nine is where we're going to be. Turn your Bibles there if you would. Luke chapter nine. Good to be with you, church. Church in the time of COVID. That's the name of my next book. Church in the time of COVID. Speaking of man, I tell you what, God has positioned us as a, uh, not only as a ministry, but as a coffee house to have really rich conversations with people, especially during this time. Um, just this week, spiritual moment, right there. I always like to point out where the spiritual moments happen at Sozo during the week. Normal business, normal activity, but right there at the bar, there was a gentleman and I that were talking, and we've had frequent conversations especially about just everything going on in the world. This guy is, he's ex-military. He's a, he's a tough dude. Drives a really boss Jeep, you know. And uh, he and I are talking, and he was just, you know, every once in a while he just kind of just dumps. He just dumps like, man, I just, I'm so frustrated, you know, mask or no mask. He comes in, he wears a mask over his mouth, but not over his nose. You know, he's, co- he's confused, right, obviously. So, you know, mask or no f- mask, right? Um, you know, what's going on with just Black Lives Matter? And, you know, he just throws everything out. And we're just kind of talking and talking. And then all of a sudden, he inserts into the conversation, if only this country turned back to the Ten Commandments. And I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll go with that. We'll go with that, you know, Ten Commandments. You know, maybe not so much that we know with our minds, but how many people know the Ten Commandments, but actually know the Ten Commandments? And then he said, you know, if only... We returned to the Ten Commandments. It became more moral, more focused on God. Things would change in our world. So I've got this just plethora. Senor, what is a plethora? It is a plethora of stuff. And, and if you picture a funnel, like all this stuff's been dumped in, but there was a moment during the week where right there, it came down to a funnel fine point where this guy had said, if only we would turn to the Ten Commandments, things would be different. And I just felt like at that moment, I had to stop and say, it's not about the Ten Commandments. It's not about overturning government organizations, Black Lives Matter, anti-maskers, whatever camp we all fall in. Before God is going to change the world, he must first change our heart. You could just tell this, he just, there were almost tears welling up in his eyes. He's a tough guy, so he would call it allergies. But I would say there was something going on where he was thinking, yeah, you know what? I'm pointing the fingers at all this stuff around me, but where's my heart? And and that's what I was challenging him with. And so then he diverted the conversation. Because sometimes, you know, a dog will chew, chew off its own leg to get out of a trap. Have you guys experienced this before? He said, what time are your services on Sunday? Let's, like, let's stop talking about my heart. Let's talk about church attendance. And I told him. But I came back to the fact of this. Whether you come to church or not, again, you're not hearing from me that church attendance is going to solve this. What you're hearing from me is that Jesus is the answer. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Because all of us are coming in here this morning. We've got questions. We've got frustrations. There's confusion. We just, we just want to know, God, what are you doing? When am I going to go back to school? When am I going to go back to work? Am I going to get my job back? What about my life savings? What about my health? What about my loved ones? What about, what about, what about? Anybody got a bunch of what about questions? There's only one question you need to answer today. What about Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Luke 9, turn your Bibles. We're going to look at verses 18 through 22. What about Jesus? And and I'm going to tell you right now, the content of today's message um, is is the most important content I can ever share with anybody. This is like, if there was one message we have to come back to time and time again, it's this one. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach it again next week. But this is the most important message. Because it's going to answer some important questions. And, and, and we're going to frame, I hope, 
our current context and where our lives are at in a, in a, in a sense of understanding what does God want, want us to answer about our own lives, our own heart. I'm praying for our world. I'm praying for our president. I'm praying for our government. I'm praying for our leaders. I'm praying for the end of coronavirus. I'm praying that our economy would be. Re- I'm praying for all that stuff. I'm not going to minimize the importance of all that. But all of it falls far short of the things we're going to talk about today. Okay? And Jesus presents us with some content that we have to wrestle with. You notice in your outline, I, I posed it in four points, the greatest blank. So you know if you're saying the greatest, it can't get any greater, right? Th- these are going to be the greatest things we talk about. And we start by looking at Luke chapter 9. Jesus has preached kingdom truth. He has displayed kingdom power he has modeled kingdom righteousness but now he's going to get to the core of the kingdom and the core of the kingdom is always about the king the today the the questions revolve around the person of christ and his plan for our lives because i'm going to tell you right now it's going to be different than you expected God always has a way of surprising us and showing us, uh, showing how our, uh, our expectations fall far short of who we thought he is and what his plan is. Luke 9, look at verse 18. And it came about that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, who do the multitudes say that I am? What's the public opinion out there of me? Just real quick, don't ever ask that for your own life. You're not going to like what you hear. Can I get an amen from somebody? Okay, good. And they answered and said, John the Baptist. And others said, Elijah. But others said, he's one of the prophets of old who has risen. And then he says to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Or maybe your translation says the Messiah. Or your translation says the anointed one. And he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anybody, which seems really kind of weird. Because he says the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Four things. The first is this, and this is so pivotal, so important, the greatest question. I love questions. I love the Socratic method of teaching when someone is able to to issue a really thought-provoking question. But here in Luke 9, we have the greatest question, and by greatest question, I mean the greatest question that any single person must answer. And it's this, who do you say Jesus is? So Jesus, verse 18, is, is, is getting away for some private time. He's praying by himself. You'll notice that Jesus doesn't really instruct his disciples in, in how to pray. He models it for them just by doing it. So he's by himself. He's praying. And you'll notice that in the Gospels, whenever Jesus is praying by himself, it's always on the cusp of something important that's about to happen. He gets away and just, just prays. So it's almost like Luke says, okay, you need to know Jesus is praying i.e. something big is about ready to happen. So he expects us all to be on the edge of our seats right now. You know, you're going you're gonna to pay for the whole seat, but you only need the edge. That's the mentality of Luke right now. Get ready, something big is about to happen. And so Jesus says to the disciples who, they're in this region that's a little bit far from home called Caesarea Philippi, and it is a pagan area. They worship the god Pan. It's definitely not their neighborhood. And so he, he wants them to just not be distracted, but he wants them to focus. And so he asks them a question. Who do, who do the people say to them? What's the, what's the word on the street? What's the public opinion poll about me? And they get three responses. And, and let me just tell you, if you were lumped up with the responses, you'd be in good company. John the Baptist, Elijah, prophet. But Jesus is, is not so much concerned about opinion, but he's concerned about conviction. In your notes, you see that. This is less about opinion and more about conviction. And this is so important because there's a lot of conversation about God. There's a lot of conversation about spiritual things. And and it's not purely what you think about something that matters. It's what you believe about something. See, opinion is all head. Conviction is about the heart. 
And, and Jesus always has a masterful way of aiming for the heart. Right? So he says to the disciples, what's the word on the street? Well, everyone has something to say about Jesus, but then Jesus frames it and says to the disciples, let's get personal, what do you guys think about me? And, and the word, what do you think about me, who do you say that I am, is plural, meaning all the disciples. So Peter, kind of the spokesman for the disciples, stands up and says, you're the Christ of God. It's not so much a matter of opinion. God is looking for this to be a place of conviction. Because there's a lot of people out there who have opinions about Jesus. You ever heard about the opinions of Jesus today? He's a good moral teacher. Anyone ever hear that before? Or he's a good moral example, or he's a good philosopher, or he's a nice guy, or he's a horrible carpenter. I don't know whatever you heard about Jesus. But this is not left or relegated to the category of public opinion. This is essentially a question every single person must answer because he's not one of, but he is the one. Meaning he's not one of the prophets, he's not one of the teachers, he's not one of the philosophers, he is the one. Because all those things that we have opinions about Jesus, they sound very lofty, but they're not complimentary at all. Right? They don't, they don't compliment Jesus in a way that displays that he is the one, capital O-N-E. We think we're saying nice things about him, but it's almost like saying, you know, the sun is one of the many lights that illuminate my house. Michael Jordan was this guy who threw around the ball with a team called the Bulls. Donald Trump is a homeowner in Florida. See, we're saying things about these things that are true, but it's not the whole truth. It's not the greatest truth about them. The sun is the star in our universe. Michael Jordan is the goat in basketball. Donald Trump is the president of the United States. Right? Anything less doesn't tell us anything complimentary about them, anything unique about them. And actually, whenever we say things that are generally complimentary, but there's nothing unique, we're actually really saying things that are very misleading. Someone once said that when it comes to identifying Jesus, partial truths that miss the biggest truth end up being a lie. If I tell you or describe to you that my wife, where is she? She's not here. Don't worry, I'm not going to say anything now. Oh, there she is. My wife is a beautiful woman among many beautiful women in the world. If I describe my wife as an, she is an individual I deeply respect. If I describe her as in a long line of women I have loved, she's one of them. Would my wife be pleased? Does she look pleased? I have damned her with my faint praise. I have insulted her by demeaning and diminishing her uniqueness and describing her in terms far below what she deserves. You don't come to me with Jesus is a nice guy. Jesus is a great philosopher. See, the opinion is not what matters, it is the conviction that Jesus presents to us the very same question and says, who do you say that I am? And don't you dare be demeaning or diminishing of me being anything but the one. This is a heart issue. This is a conviction issue. Get away from all the nonsense that says, oh, he's like the Dalai Lama, or he's like Gandhi, or he's like Buddha, or he's like my saintly grandmother. No, he's not. He's far superior than any of those fine people, but he's not one of, he is the one. Lewis, C.S. Lewis, don't worry, I'm, I'm just introducing Lewis. I'm not going full Lewis on you this morning. He per presented in a way where he had the liar, lunatic, Lord discussion. Google it later. C.S. Lewis, liar, lunatic, Lord. Lewis, great philosopher, greatest mind of the 20th century, said he has not left any alternative option to us 
he's either Lord because you can't classify him as a liar or a lunatic. The things he said, the things he did doesn't qualify him as that. He's Lord. He's left no other option open to us. Bono from U2 has his own Lord, liar, lunatic thing. Now we're in the best of both worlds. See, we're talking about C.S. Lewis and we're talking about U2, greatest band ever. Yes, I agree. So Bono, you may disagree with his politics. That's okay. But you're not going to disagree with his conviction of who Christ is. A few years ago, he did an interview where he took the words of Lewis and he gave us the Bono version. Let's listen to it for a couple minutes. And I want you to hear conviction. I look to the scriptures for poetic truth, um, as well as the sort of historical stuff I'm, I'm, I'm in, interested in. And of course, there was a histor historical Jesus. No, I'm talking about God. Oh, right. And, and do well, you I see, I, I, the, per the person of Christ is my way to understand uh, God. Do you pray? Yes. To whom or what do you pray? To and Christ. Way? To Christ. Yeah. And, and what do you pray for? I pray to get to know um, <laughs> the will of God, because then the prayers have more chance of coming true. I mean, that's the thing about prayer, isn't it? I mean, we don't do it in a very lofty way in our family. There's just a bunch of us on the bed, usually. We have a very big bed in our house. And all our f we've prayed with all our kids. We, we you know, we just... We, we read the scriptures, we pray. It's not even regular. Sometimes if we go to church on a Sunday, we go when the church has ended, and we'll just go in on our own as a family. For peace and quiet. For peace and quiet, and we'll pray, usually about people that we know who are struggling with something, um, illness so, so, or so whatever. So then, what or who was Jesus, as far as you're concerned? I think it's, the, it's a defining question for a Christian, is who was Christ. And, and I don't think you're let off easily by saying a great thinker or a great philosopher or, a, a, you know, because actually he went round saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, <laughs> was the Son of God or he was not. No, no, nuts. Nuts, yes. Forget <laughs> yes. rock and roll messianic complexes. <laughs> this is like, I mean, Charlie Manson type delirium. And I find it hard to accept that all the millions and millions of lives, half the earth for 2,000 years, have been touched, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I just, hmm. I don't believe it. I, I so therefore it follows that you believe he was divine. Yes. And therefore it follows that you believe that he rose physically from the dead. Yes, yeah, I'm into, uh, I mean, I have no problem with miracles. <laughs> <laughs> Living around them. I am one. So, so when you pray then, you pray to Jesus. Yes. The risen Jesus. Yes. And you believe that he made promises which will come true. Yes. I do. I look to the pretty, scripture. Pretty solid, huh? You know, it's not even blinking an eye. He, he tells you what he believes. Because he's been walking with Jesus for a long time, however imperfectly. And the, and the interviewer is just kind of wrestling with this, right? Almost like there's this disbelief that's kind of leading these questions, like, you, you believe in miracles? Like, no one in their right mind believes in miracles. Oh, you believe that Jesus was God? He rose from the dead? Yes, yes, yes. Because when you look at the person and work of Christ and you answer the question who Jesus was, there's a conviction that sets in. If you're an honest investigator of these things, your confession will be like that of Peter's that says, he is the anointed one. This is the fundamental Christian confession, that he is the prophet who reveals God's word to us. He is the priest who atones for our sins, and he is the king who is the Lord over all creation. This great question must be answered with, secondly, a great confession. Point number two. The confession I want you to have is the confession that Peter gave, being the representative of the disciples that said, you are the Messiah. 
You are the anointed one. You are the Christ of God. Ladies and gentlemen, verse 20, circle the word the Christ of God. That is the heart of Christianity. That is the fundamental belief within the Christian faith. Everything else is, is, is wrong. This is why the question of who is Jesus is so critically important. Messiah is the most frequently used term by the apostles in the New Testament to refer to Jesus. Most frequently used. Yet it's the least frequently used by Jesus for himself. It's almost like he doesn't want to be the, proclaim himself to be Messiah. He wants you to experience that. And, and as we experience it, we've got to kind of toy between two things because when it comes to confession, something we need to think about first is this. There's a confession of mere profession. And then secondly, there's a confession of pure possession. This is just kind of a, a, a cute way of saying things I've already expressed in the past if you've kind of been a part of the, 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 the Missio community is just because you profess doesn't mean you necessarily possess. Because would you agree that there's a lot of people out there who profess Jesus, but their lives, like, you say this, but you don't act this way. I was actually talking to someone in between services. Single person who just started dating someone, and they thought, hey, we're Christians. And then all of a sudden, they're like, no, they're not. Just because you profess it doesn't mean you possess it. And I'll tell you what, so much of Jesus' teaching is focused on the, the heart. Like right belief will lead to right behavior. Right b- belief will lead to a, a proper conduct before God. And so here's Peter, and he expresses, you're the Christ. Now, I want you to think about this. This is the Christ that was spoken of beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is the the Christ that these men grew up in households where mom and dad had been eagerly awaiting the one that the prophets foretold. This is the Christ who is the answer to Isaiah 9, right? Which doesn't just have to be for Christmas cards, right? For unto us a child is born and a son is given. Yay, we can do this in July, right? That he's the wonderful God, he, wonderful counselor, eternal father, mighty God, and prince of peace. Peter is bringing all this hundreds of years of history, longing, looking for, to bear on the situation, says, you're him, And Jesus commends him and says, you have rightly declared. You have correctly assessed. There is a proper confession that we need to understand. But just because someone confesses doesn't mean they possess. Because what you're going to see now in point number three is the great revelation. Now mark this as a historical event in Missio Dei history, the shortest point Scott Morgan has ever gone through. Point two to point three. How long did it take us? Three minutes. Point number three, the greatest revelation. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag team this with the previous point. Because here's what we need to understand, and this is a little bit of information that Luke leaves out, but is talked about in Matthew chapter 16. Peter gives the confession, and then Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed that confession to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And I tell you, you, Peter, are the rock on which I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not stand against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now consider this. Consider this. Side note. The Roman Catholic Church will use this as their reasoning for the Pope. Any recovering Roman Catholics here? You are, you're welcome in our midst. We've got a lot of recovering Catholics. But there is nothing in this text, which is the text, that says that we are to appoint a pope, that there's going to be a papal secession, that the pope speaks directly to God, and from his chair that we call ex cathedra speaks the very voice of God, and that there's papal infallibility, meaning you don't challenge the pope when he says, I've received revelation from God. There is nothing there of this. As a matter of fact, it is not on Peter in which Christ is going to build his church. It's on Peter's confession that Christ is going to build his church. What's his confession? That Jesus is the Christ. 
any church that calls itself a church that doesn't proclaim Jesus is the Christ is not a church. Matter of fact, we can have church all over the building, but if you don't preach Christ as the anointed one, the chosen one, the son of God, the Messiah, it's not a church. The church is built on the confession. The church is not built on Peter. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 2 debunks that because the foundation of the church is the teachings of all the apostles. The greatest revelation is that which doesn't come to us via human will. It comes to us through the divine word. Two points in your notes you need to mark down because this is so critically important. Because it answers the question, who professes, who possesses? See, we want to think that somehow we're responsible for confessing Christ to be the Messiah when in reality that has to ultimately be a work of God because there's no one who seeks after God, there's no one who wants God, there's no one who wants to even confess God. See, human will obstructs seeing. Human will wants the philosopher, the teacher, the great moral example. The human will doesn't want a divine suffering savior. John chapter 1. He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who are possessed now by eternal life, who believed in his name. He gave them the right, know who's the acting agent here, to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is why Peter's confession is acknowledged by Christ as being that which is divinely given. Meaning, any true work of God in our lives is Acted by, first and foremost, God, not us. This is the dividing line between profession and possession. You may profess Jesus, but are you possessed by him? See, divine word instructs seeing. Matter of fact, you may want to write another word down, seven instructs, right? Enables. See, without God opening our eyes to who Jesus is, there's only profession, there's no possession. There's got to be an outside agent that acts upon our lives because there's none who seeks after God. Matter of fact, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. See, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you, you may want to write that down, look at it later. It says, the natural man or woman, the, the person that is not spiritually awakened, doesn't understand the things of God because they're spiritually appraised. And then he says in the next book, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So everyone is spiritually born blind into this world, and the the God of this age, the enemy, is blinding every person from seeing Jesus For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ, Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, now don't miss this, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is saying, when I say the words, let there be light, what do you think of? You think of Genesis. But a greater creation is not what what, what happens physically in our world with the creation of the Son. The greatest act of God is when He opens the heart of someone who is blind to Jesus and gives them sight to see the glory of Christ. Can I get an amen from somebody? I'm sweating like a pig and I'm not not getting anything from you. (laughs) Do you see how important this is? That outside God working on our hearts, we are blind. You can profess all you want, but in your heart, there's nothing that's changed. And this is where God steps in and removes the blinders and gives us vision and says, let there be light in Scott Morgan's heart. (gasps) There's Jesus. And when you behold the glory of the Lord, there is nothing like the glory of the Lord. And you know what happens when you, when you taste and you see that the Lord is good? You want more. You want more. Let me, let me encourage you, just, just real quick application. I, I, 
when you come to know Christ, here's the good news for all of us, because I know some of you are frustrated. Some of you are like perfectionists. You want to come to know Jesus, and you want to know everything about Jesus. Is there anyone else uh, like that? Like when you, when you embrace something, you want to know all of it. Let me just tell you, when you come to know Jesus, you're not going to ever find out everything about Jesus, but you're going to begin at the play, place of just knowing him to begin with. I don't know. I've been married to my wife 28 years. I don't know everything about my wife. But the more I get to know her, the more I'm like, this is awesome. I can't say that true for her toward me, but this is me towards her. See, when you come to know Jesus, you're going to know the most important thing about him, that he's the Messiah. But now your life is set on a course where you begin to know him and walk with him, and learn about him, and abide in him. For those of you who are frustrated because you don't know everything about God, you're in good company. Jesus is infinite and inexhaustible. Jesus is going to take eternity to know. How long is eternity? It's a long time. Here's the good news. You may be sitting here and you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused, Pastor, because I, I profess Christ, but I'm not sure if I possess Jesus. Let me give you a word of assurance. One of the greatest ways you can look within your own life to see if you're possessed by Christ is this. Is there an unquenchable thirst to know him more? Full stop, period. If there exists within you a deep desire to hunger and thirst for righteousness, you're possessed by Christ. If there is a desire that supersedes all other desires to know him, you're possessed by Christ. If you can say with Paul from Philippians chapter 3, I consider everything as loss for the sake of knowing him, you are possessed by Christ. But if your life in Christ is merely made up of a Sunday morning go to church and once in a while open my Bible and listen to my Christian radio, if that's it and there's no deeper longing, I would sit there and say, you need to examine your life. Because religious activity is one thing, religious passion is another. Is anyone scared of my bug eyes right now? <laughs> when the bug eyes come out, you gotta, you gotta get ready. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? This is so important that God doesn't want us to be involved with religious busyness, religious activity. He wants us to be consumed in knowing him. If my life with my wife merely consisted of just activity and I didn't get a chance to know her heart, this marriage would be just destroyed. This is how you know you possess. There's a good obsession with Christ. There's an unquenchable thirst for Jesus. This is the heart of what we're talking about. Which leads to our last point, and it's this. The greatest redemption. So you have the greatest question, right? Who is Christ? You, everyone must answer this. Your confession, your response to that is, is so telling of where your heart is, but ultimately the work of the heart is a work of God, which is the greatest revelation, right? God has given us his word, the Bible. He has sent the word Jesus. This is all revelation, right? God telling us how much he loves us, what he wants of us, but he's got to first change us from the inside. But how he does it is remarkable and, and often defies our explanation and, and expectations. Notice what it says in Luke. You are the Christ. And then Jesus says, verse 21, be warned. He warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anybody, which seems very peculiar, doesn't it? It's like, 
wait, isn't that why you came? We're supposed to tell people? Because there's a reason why they do not go out and declare it from the, the rooftops, right? It's almost like Jesus puts his, his hand over their mouth and says, be quiet about this. Look at verse 22. Here's the reason. The Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man must be rejected. The Son of Man must be killed. And then the Son of Man will be raised. While Peter answered the person question, Peter didn't understand the plan question. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is a conundrum in the Christian life that many of us have experienced. We come to know Jesus, and the plan for our lives is different than the plan we want for our own lives. Can anyone testify to that? Matter of fact, the other gospel writers key us into this because Jesus is saying the reason you need to be quiet is that I know in your mind you're, politi- you're, you're expecting a political hero. You're expecting a, a military deliverer. Their idea of the Messiah was one who was going to be a conqueror. Their idea of the Messiah wasn't one who's going to be conquered first. This is why Jesus, in another account, which, again, Luke doesn't give us the, 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 the full picture, says this in Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 8. He said this plainly, and Peter took him aside. So now can you imagine, like, Peter taking Jesus aside and rebuking him? Now, let's just be honest. We've all rebuked Jesus. Anyone ever been upset at Jesus? You're all liars. Okay, let's continue. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebukes Peter. So there's a a whole lot of rebuking going on. And he says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter refused to accept the plan that the Messiah will suffer, be rejected, be killed, and be raised. It it didn't fit his theology. Matter of fact, Matthew continues and says this about, Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen over my dead body. And he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, saying, for you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Can I just tell you that we're all in good company with Peter? Because we've all been in a place where we've come to know him as the Messiah and we're ready to tell him what the plan for our lives is. Has anyone been there before? Like, God, let me tell you what, I'm, what we're going to do with my life as if God's sitting back going, oh, ooh, that sounds good. And I'm going to tell you right now, the plans we have for our lives is lives that are full of comfort, full of ease, full of joy, no pain, no heartache, no suffering. And I'm going to tell you right now, When you confess Christ, you embrace a suffering servant. The way of Jesus is a suffering way. The way of Jesus is an uncomfortable way. As a matter of fact, next week, we get to talk about what it means to be a disciple. Because if you guys haven't seen yet, verse 23 in Luke, if anyone wishes to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, right? Discipleship. That's a whole different message for next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, we're going to get there. But first, understand the mission of Christ in making disciples. Because there's a difference between the Savior we want and the Savior we need. Can I get an amen on that? We are masters at creating gods after our own image. We are masters of creating manageable deities that we can form and shape and sculpt that reflect the gods we want, but it's, Jesus has come to show us that the God we want is not the God that's going to do anything for us. It's the God we need, and that's Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, It is hard to understand the ways of God. And and, and can I just insert into what we read in Mark 8 and and Matthew 16 that any time we instruct God on what his will is for our lives, we are acting in the ways of Satan, not in the ways of Jesus. Can anyone just take a big gulp right now? Did he just say that? 
Anytime you get your eyes off the biblical Christ and the biblical Christ words and will and instruction, anytime you come into the, into the conversation and you demand your way over God's way, you are acting like the devil and not acting like your Savior. That's a tough thing to, that's a tough thing to say. But the Savior we want is a Savior that doesn't suffer He's not rejected. He's not killed. This is why Peter reacted the way he did. I'm not going to let anyone touch you because if you get conquered, we're not going to conquer. But just like I told my friend at the bar this week, until God changes the world, he's not going to do that without first changing your heart. And before you experience a, a conquering motif, which is, you know, we all want like, yeah, we're going to be the winners. We're going to... He needs to conquer you. See, Peter was right about the end. Glory and honor. But he was wrong about the means. Suffering and shame. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 18. I don't have it up on the screen, but here's what Paul says. This message of a savior, a suffering servant, which I'm going to tell you right now, it shouldn't be a surprise because it's been with us and been communicated to, to us ever since Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God talks to the woman and says, there will be a war between your seed and, and the serpent seed, that is the first picture of the gospel in the Bible. There will be suffering. There will be shame. There will be difficulty. And then you go to Isaiah 53, the, the masterful chapter on the suffering servant. This has been God's plan from the beginning, and yet we tend to miss it because we can't get our minds off the fact that God loves me. He, he, he can't bring anything bad in my life. Anyone grow up with parents that discipline them? Yeah, the belt and the wooden spoon were the two greatest tools in my house growing up. Can I get an amen from somebody? Some of you are like, that's horrible. No, that's why I'm the fine, upsetting citizen I am today. <laughs> the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. Hebrews chapter 12. The Savior suffered for us what makes us think we will not suffer as well? Did not Jesus say, the student is not different than the master? If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. We're having a hard time right now in our world, in our culture. Because doggone it, this is America! This is the land that God has blessed! We shouldn't be going through all this crap! Oh yeah, show me chapter verse. We are more into our politics and trusting politics than we are in trusting and looking to our God. This, this is all part of God's plan. You think all this is happening and then God's like, oh crap, what happened? I lost control. No. God is reminding us all the importance of answering the question, who is Jesus? Don't trust in your strength. Don't trust in your wisdom. Don't trust in your political party. Don't trust in your health. Trust Him. Christ. James chapter 1. This is very relevant to us right now. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of many kinds. Consider it all joy when you're going through difficulties. How many of us have had a hard, hard time finding joy right now in this time? It's there. It's there. It's because the reason we don't have joy during trials is because our focus is off. Our focus is off. Remember when Jesus was stood before the crowd in the robe, in the crowd of thorns, right? He's bleeding, he's been spit upon, he's been beaten up, he hasn't got any sleep, right? And there's Pilate, 
saying, I am allowed to release one prisoner to you. We've got, on one hand, Jesus, and everyone's going, he's a sorry excuse for a deliverer. What are our other options? Well, I've got this guy named Barabbas. Barabbas was a political zealot. Who did the people choose? Barabbas. Because at least they thought, he looks like the guy who's going to kick Rome's butt. Let's get him. Wrong choice. Too many people are clamoring, fighting, arguing about things that ultimately don't matter for time and eternity. Mask or unmask, who gives a crap? Trump or Biden, who gives a crap? Football, no football. Who gives a crap? Come, now we're getting sensitive. Black or white, who gives a crap, right? What, fill in the blank. All the stuff that we are spending so much energy on, when in the end of the day, the only question is this. Who's Jesus? The entrance of the kingdom of heaven doesn't say, oh, Democrats enter, enter here and the Republicans enter here. You know, it doesn't say Cowboys fans over here, Cardinals fans over there. It doesn't say anti-maskers over here, anti-vaxxers over here. You know, whatever your thing is, if your thing is not Jesus, then it, the, the, the door's not open to you. It's Jesus or no Jesus. Th that's it. And I'm not minimizing and trivializing all that other stuff I mentioned. So don't walk out and be like, that guy hates Biden, that guy hates Trump. No, in the greater scheme of things, I'm not going to stand before God one day and he's going to say, Trump or Biden? Trump, okay, come into my heaven. Biden, come into my heaven. He's going to say this, Jesus or no Jesus? And I'm going to cry. And I'm going to confess Christ. And my guy's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on home. Can I get an amen? Fill your feeds with Christ. Fill your posts with Jesus. Fill your conversations with him. Because all I know at the end of the day is you don't want to be on your deathbed and have rallied for vaccinations when in reality you should have been rallying for Christ. Do you hear me, church? There is something infinitely more important than the stuff that we argue about. The Savior we need is the Savior that God has sent. Someone once said, our greatest need, if it had been information, God would have sent us a, an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, he would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, he would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, and so he sent us a savior. Thank you. Thank you, God. And now we have to understand that our salvation has been purchased through suffering. But it will also be sealed and preserved with suffering. This is the way of discipleship. Now, I know I'm not selling you guys on Jesus. I know if I'm writing a book on this, you're like, dang, that's a little dark. I'm not getting that book. Because we don't want to embrace the path of suffering when in reality, suffering is the only way we'll know we need a Savior like Christ. James 1, read it this week. The rewards of knowing Christ. L listen to this. I'm, we're going to close with this. The rewards of knowing Christ are not fully ours yet church do you hear what i'm saying we are promised difficulties we are promised trials we are promised tribulations we want freedom now we want power now we want life now but you know what jesus says to us in an ever still small voice? 
You guys ready for this? Lean in. Lean in. Be patient. Back row Baptist. Did you guys hear that? What did I say? Be patient. Peanut gallery over here. (laughs) What did I say? Be patient. Though we are experiencing a momentary light affliction, this is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory awaiting us. Be patient. So what's required of us now? Because I've, I've teased you, I've given you an appetizer. What, what does God expect of me now? That's next Sunday. How's that for a cliffhanger? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to follow the suffering Savior who is also the conquering King? Those two things can coexist in the same person. What does that mean for me now? Let's talk about that next week, okay? I love you. I'm praying for you. We've got an amazing God who has sent forth an amazing Savior so that we can live amazing lives. I know that might be hard for some of you to see right now, but if you have Christ, you have everything. Do you you believe that? If you have Christ, you don't need anything else. Let's stand, let's pray. Oh, Father, you're so good to us. We have declared through song today that we are no longer slaves. We have been adopted into your family. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the change of heart. We thank you for the fact that we, were who, we who were unloved have now been so extravagantly loved by you. Lord, you have shown us today that you are not only the suffering servant, but you're also the great high priest who can't identify with us in our weakness, but you do. You've been down the path before we went down the path. And so we're so grateful for a God who is up close and personal and intimate with us and knows us better than we know ourselves. Help us take the truths today and and let us just do some honest, honest wrestling with you. But my prayer is this, as we wrestle with you, may we always be conquered by you. May we always know the delight of a God who's willing to crush us in order to heal us. The God who has been known as being the God who brings beauty from ashes. Restoration to that which has been damaged and clarity to our lives which has been so unclear for too long. Lord, thank you for shining the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ into our hearts. To you be the glory forever and ever. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his peace and his grace forever and ever. Love you, church. Love you. Have a great week. Praying for you. See you soon.